You are listening to the Speech Space Podcast, a podcast full of tips and resources for SLPs. I'm your host, Jessica Cassidy, and this is episode 25. Hey there. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Today, we are going to be talking about selective mutism. And I really don't have anything else to report about, so we're just going to jump right in. So ASHA defines selective mutism as a complex childhood anxiety disorder characterized by a child's inability to speak and communicate effectively in select social settings. Now, children with uh, selective mutism, you know, this this is going to create a problem for them academically because they generally do not speak at school. Now, it is estimated that the prevalence of selective mutism is less than 1%, with reported rates as low as 0.02% and as high as 1.9%. It appears to affect more females than males, and there also appears to be a higher rate amongst immigrant children and language minority children as well. Since selective mutism falls within the category of an anxiety disorder, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders has set the following criteria in order for a child to be diagnosed. So they must demonstrate um, consistent failure to speak in specific situations in which there's an expectation for speaking, so like at school, but they also have demonstrated the ability to show that they can speak in other situations. Uh, The disturbance needs to interfere with educational or occupational achievement or with social communication. The duration of the disturbance is at least one month, and the failure to speak is not attributable to lack of knowledge or comfort with the spoken language required in the social situation. And finally, the disturbance is not better explained by communication disorder and does not occur exclusively during the course of autism spectrum disorder, schizophrenia, or any other psychological disorder. Children with selective mutism avoid initiating and participating in conversations, and they might rely on gesturing, nodding, pointing, or whispering to communicate, to avoid verbally communicating. So you might be wondering if you have a student like this, How do you treat selective mutism? Where do you start? What do you do? So let's take a look at some of the treatment options that are recommended. First, we're going to touch on some behavioral approaches. So these strategies might be incorporated into your sessions and used across disciplines as well. Specifically for the behavioral approaches, you might also be closely working alongside a school counselor or psychologist. So a behavioral perspective attempts to decrease the anxiety that the child is having and provide reinforcement when they do speak. Typically, this is done in subtle ways that feel comfortable and non-threatening to the child. So one of those ways is through exposure-based practice, and that is where the child speaks in increasingly difficult speaking situations. And the goal there is to have the child feel more relaxed in the situations that they currently perceive as threatening and to gradually improve their ability to speak in different situations. Another approach is systematic desensitization, and that uses relaxation techniques along with gradual exposure to anxiety-provoking situations. Another behavioral approach is stimulus fading, and that is where you're going to gradually increase exposure to a fearful stimulus, and generally the child is going to be rewarded in these situations. Contingency management, positive reinforcement, and shaping are other strategies that can be utilized. And for these, positive reinforcement is contingent upon verbalization and attempts to communicate are reinforced. So the goal there, of course, is making verbalizing more rewarding than not responding. Now let's look at some more of the SLP-specific treatment approaches. So the, one of them is going to be to use AAC. Now this one's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, you know, children can use drawings, gestures, or picture symbols to help them communicate. And this is often an initial strategy. It's definitely not something that you want to use for long term, but it's it can be a good starting point. And it's supposed to be facilitating speech, of course, rather than replacing it. So you don't want your student to become 
reliant on this. This is just kind of a starting point. Now, another approach is augmented self-modeling. And for this approach, children watch a video of themselves engaging in a positive verbal interaction, but in a setting that's challenging for them. Now, the goal of that is to have the child have a successful communication experience, but in a setting that makes them feel uncomfortable. Another approach is the developmental individual differences relationship-based floor time model. And this model uses the concepts of self-regulation, attention, engagement, intentional communication, and purposeful problem-solving communication. It is based on functional emotional development capacities and attempts, and it works to enhance those capacities. It might also include co-treats with an OT and anti-anxiety strategies from a behavioral health professional. Now, another approach is the ritual sound approach. This is a cognitive and behaviorally based treatment that's part of the social communication anxiety treatment or SCAT. The SLP here starts with non-speech tasks like breathing or coughing, and then we describe how producing voiceless consonants are similar, for example, um, like how the K sound is similar to coughing. And then sounds on an alphabet board are crossed off as the child is able to successfully produce them. And then we work up a hierarchy where voiceless consonants are paired with vowels and then other voiceless consonants to form words. Another approach is the social pragmatic approach. And this approach puts an emphasis on social participation that is both verbal and nonverbal. Interactive activities are used to help the child accept being part of a joint activity. Then nonverbal communication is implemented, followed by a hierarchy of sounds that starts with non-speech sounds and then progresses towards words. Language complexity consciously and gradually increases from there. And the last approach we're going to mention today is called vocal control approach. And for this approach, the child starts off with non-speech tasks to help them establish a sense of control over voicing. They start by humming and making environmental sounds, and then they build on that, that mm sound from the humming, and work their way up to producing vowels, syllables, words, phrases, and then on to sentences. So that is it for today's episode. I hope that you learned something new. And as always, I appreciate you taking the time to listen. I did go ahead and put together a handout today with the treatment approaches that I mentioned here. So if you'd like to download that, you can do so by going to bit.ly, which is bit.ly forward slash selective mutism. And also I did want to mention if you're in need of no prep materials, especially no print, then I wanted to give a reminder that the digital SLP price is going to be jumping up soon. So you want to head on over to the speechspace.com forward slash digital SLP to learn more about the membership and to lock in your rate before it goes up. If you found this episode to be helpful, please consider leaving a five-star review because that will make it easier for other SLPs like you to find the podcast. All right, guys, thank you so much for hanging out with me and I will catch you next week.